in life, we have opportunities in time to help people. When a person literally calls after a lot of difficulties in life, what do you say literally? How is it that you decide to help them? Do you simply say, I'm too busy to help a person? Do you open your heart's mind and soul to the fact that maybe Lord God is calling you to do something new, to try something different, or literally to have be impacted by another person's life? A lot of people won't handle homelessness well. You see, many financial planners tell us the truth, that literally most families that are in the middle class are one or two paychecks literally away from homelessness. They don't always plan in life is not true. They live outside their means is probably true. They rarely make budgets is mostly true. But openly, we don't know that from exact data. We're making supposition. We are lending opinions. We are talking about a lot of things in the opinion format here. I'd like to tell you about two circumstances recently that impacted a man's life. It's really important to tell the truth in life, so we're going to tell you honest facts. We're not going to always say who they are, but if we share it, it's factually true. It produces lawsuits sometimes, but that's not on us, it's on them. We are literally investigating in opportunities for homeless in the Indianapolis area and sort of across the nation. The first appalling thing we discovered when we found a national organization that supposedly is in function right now, although there's no phone number to call successfully and reach a live person very well, is that there are many church organizations that literally are saying that they do not want there to be homeless people on the streets in their community. You see, the idea is that literally every single homeless person is a derelict who has a drug addiction, an alcohol problem, or some sort of sexual improbability, or something like this. I can tell you probably factually that that is not statistically accurate, that people go through medical failures, they go through difficulties in life, they lose employment, they lose jobs, they lose opportunities, they lose resources, but most importantly in all of this, they lose relationships. It's sort of like when someone goes through divorce, a lot of people who knew the couple will sort of pull back. A handful of people will pull and gravitate to one side or the other, whichever literally makes them feel better in life in terms of talking with them about the holy hell that it is to lose a life partner in life, no matter how long or short that journey together was, whether it be seven years or literally 20 years, a person's impact on one's life is significant, regardless of the length of time. A love interest lost is incredibly difficult, most therapists will tell you, and openly there are grief counseling programs for those who lose a loved one completely. Whether that loss is the transition to Lord God's house in heaven, or whether that loss is someone simply said, I can't do this anymore. I'm not content anymore. My soul is not served in this relationship anymore. And openly, it might be other things of more intimate nature that aren't being served because people take people for granted all the time in intimate conversation and other things. But I'm not talking about it in a way that's any different than most people, or maybe I am. You see, when I talk about homelessness with executive directors, they're more than happy to tell me about who they help, what they do, how they serve people. They will literally take in a person's private information, their social security number, their driver's license. They might even do a background check on them to look them up to make sure they're not getting into any legal hot water. That is not actually their legal right unless they sign someone off and say, we're going to do this to you. They don't always tell people when they run those checks, but some of them do. Now, practically, when we're talking about homelessness, we are talking about the fact that someone cannot produce two things. First, they cannot produce a home, literally because of a loss of income stream or revenue resources. Or two, they literally have lost the ability to have credit because of a legal problem, a financial difficulty, or someone has stolen their credit completely or interfered with their lawful right to maintain positive credit. So are we now looking at this system a little differently? Maybe, maybe not. As I continued my research into a personal issue that I've faced now twice, literally because of people interfering with my lawful rights to make a living, my lawful rights to pay my bills, my lawful rights to do things without harming my name from credit agencies who lied to me, said they were going to prove something that was not my fault. And then I go and full and lo and behold, find that that very agency that told me that is literally putting more problems on my name legally. You see, people in those positions are apparently allowed to lie in order to produce information for their companies to utilize to harm people's life. 
because that's in essence what's happened when someone loses income. They run out of the ability to pay for their utilities, to pay for the electricity, to put a roof over their house, and sometimes to put food on the table. Now, God bless the churches that collect food items, literally that are canned, that are single servings, because sometimes the one person who's lost the life has to go out and find more life elsewhere and leave a family behind. But openly, that's not always true. Sometimes an entire family loses an in, a loved one or loses an income stream, and that produces then a family that's homeless. But in truth, there are not enough shelters in Indianapolis is absolutely 100% truth. The fact that politicians and other leaders of the communities will not allow physical buildings to be donated or land to be purchased to create shelters an actual abomination to the Lord. What is absolutely stunning to me is that churches will pay millions of dollars and put themselves in debt for literally years based on a promise that they will produce enough patronage, they will produce enough parishioners to literally make a life worth living and retirement worth having in terms of their congregational efforts, in terms of their financial planning, to be able to pay back those loans. And yet, those churches literally sit completely empty almost all day long during the work week, unless they have a childhood program or unless they have some teenage programs running, but it's usually only a day or two a week. Now, some mega churches do literally have a program running every single night, but it's usually not something that everyone would go to every single night. That's a marketing failure for sure when they have such land, when they have such property, but literally when they have so many empty rooms that could be turned into quick stays for people who are losing their life. It also produces a place for people to go to when they have the inkling of helping the homeless, a place that's not in the inner city, literally, where they'll be hit on by the people who live outside those homes and those shelters. Now, why do people live outside the shelters? Two main reasons. The reason, number one, is there aren't enough shelters to house everyone. Number two is because, literally, the shelters are more like a college dormitory, actually even less. They're more like an inmate situation, where there's literally bunks, where men sleep together and room together. They also literally have like uh, high school gymnasium type showers where a man cannot privately bathe himself, wash himself, and do intimate things to his body to keep it clean without getting someone looking at them funny. Now think about it. We've all got parts that need to be washed and we've got intimate spaces that need to be really cleaned well to stay healthy, wealthy, and wise in a way in our mind. One little bug in the right spot of an intimate area, and literally, you're down for the count. We all know this practically in our health classes. We all got that lesson in the 8th, 7th, and ninth grade, but openly, I might have put the numbers out of order, but I'm trying to make a point here, that if we're literally going to treat people with dignity and respect, we're not going to make them go into a punishment situation of, you can sleep with all these other men that you literally don't know. You can have this teeny little locker to put your life's worth in, and you can maybe have a locker or a lock for it for the day, but openly, once the day the doors are shut during the day, you've got to be out in the street making a living. Some people can get those jobs quickly, others of them can't. I can tell you I just called a Christian clinic who literally told me that they don't house certain types of men. You see, the Christian world apparently literally thinks that there are men who are well endowed all the time. They don't honor the fact that Lord God makes all types of men. Some men have appendage shortages. Now, I'm just going to make that in a comical point of view because there are people who will literally talk about the size of all sorts of things in life, and I'm not trying to be inappropriate and from a Christian standpoint or any other religious standpoint. Modesty is always the best policy. Policy has been a patron's saint statement for a lineage of lifetimes in the world of history of men. It has always been a sacred thing to have the human body sheltered from the storm. And what I literally mean is, why is it in these shelters that they don't have private stalls for someone to take a shower in to show the modesty of their body to no one but the Lord? Why is it that they don't have single rooms or double rooms even for men to share a room to create community, but to also have a private space to pray unto the Lord, to talk with others in a private communion space. But openly, is it because they presume that all men are illicitly trying to do something with one another and they've got to keep a watchful eye on them completely down to their naked bodies? You see, I'm making fun a little bit of a major problem in the Indianapolis community that literally police think they're going to help a homeless person by shitting on them the minute they get to sleep in a car or in a safe place next to a building seeking shelter from the storm. 
Now let's talk about the practicality of homelessness. I really want you to get this because I never understood why people in a community like mine would go homeless. I lived in an affluent community. I lived on a beautiful street. I paid a reasonable fair price for rent. I almost never had a theft problem until the very last days of being there. And literally, I believe it's because the community presidents, the leaders, decided to put in all kinds of multi-million dollar housing in an old school place that literally brought in the riffraff and the riffraff continues to keep moving north. And I don't mean that in an immodest way. I don't mean to disparage people who are undereducated and I literally don't mean to disparage any particular racial group that are often considered in those realms. But what I'm really talking about is the modest effort that people are making to help the homeless. Yes, all homeless people need a toothbrush and toothpaste, but literally how many pieces of those items do we really need on hand in a church that literally doesn't deliver them and that they're stockpiled across the entire Indianapolis area. You see, there isn't a really good homeless initiative. What really needs to happen is a bunch of churches get together and say, we'll collect these, you collect that, we'll collect this, and they separate out what's needed. A good quality bag with backpack straps is essential to a homeless person. A good quality bag that is tear-proof and rip-proof is also essential. A great bag that is weatherproof when it rains is absolutely fundamental. Now, there is one sheltering group that did provide me a bag, and it appears to be somewhat weatherproof. I can't promise it's rip and tear proof, but they were producing bulk and they had a budget. But buying spray to weatherproof bags, that might be a good idea. It also produces a problem if you're keeping canned foods or other foods nearby because it literally seeps into those plastics that aren't prepared for those chemicals. But that's just an experience I've had recently with some crackers I was given. I literally knew I couldn't eat them. I didn't have to check one second with God. It was reeking of a smell. I couldn't believe the executive director couldn't smell it. It might have been while she tried to take it away from me, but she literally got that I wouldn't eat it if it wasn't right for me. Now we're talking a little bit about food, but let's get back to the sheltering problem. I literally was just told by one famous shelter in the community that is faith-based that they would not tolerate a man that didn't have a penis. Now, openly, let's talk about that for a minute. First of all, how would they ever know that person didn't have one? Second of all, what right is it for them to comment about whether or not the person has one or not? Third, what right is it for them to say unto the Lord that that person is not literally a man in their heart, mind, and soul? And that's an issue that I'm really going to piss on completely, because I find this part of the Christian right absolutely offensive. Now, why am I saying this? Am I personally involved in the issue? Maybe. Am I outing myself in some way? Sure, what the hell? Because people do it all the time. That's what my siblings feel. My mother even thought it's popular now to be that. No, it's actually not popular. It's not an easy little path. And openly, I'm going to talk about that in another interview I'm going to be having very soon. But I don't want to get off the point here. The point is that when you have mass accommodations, you produce an opportunity for the men who have ill will in their hearts to do ill will things. When you have private rooms, you provide a point of protection for that man's body, his property, his paperwork. That is what an apartment complex provides in theory. That is what a locked door provides in theory. But openly, when we're talking about a showering situation, this is which is where it's outlandish. Who the hell wants to take a mass shower with a bunch of other men? Sure, I guess homeless people tolerate it, but who gives the managers of those facilities the right to watch them take a shower? That's more the indication of an immoral society. You see, having a shower with a door that is lockable but still openable to a point by a staff member is reasonable. I understand that some homeless men go through depression. I understand that there literally might be sex going on amongst men who are tired or horny or whatever the hell it might be. And I'm not trying to be immoral here. I'm trying to be honest about men's lives. We all know the statistics of how many times a man can feel some emotions like that. We don't have to be childish about the whole thing. It's truthful. I can't say what happens in locker rooms because for most of my life, I was sheltered from those difficult moments of time as a child. I was not allowed to participate in certain sports because of the harm to my physical body because I'm a little fella. And I'm still a little fella. And I can sleep perfectly fine in the front seat of a vehicle. That's how little I physically am. But you know what? To the women of my life, they think I'm 10 feet tall because that's practically what people who love us do. They raise us up. They tell us we're perfect just the way that we are. They don't try to manhandle our lives. They don't try to watch us shower, and they certainly don't try to 
put us in group homes like it's a mental institution or something else. Now, I'm going to talk about that in another audio cast at some point because right now I'm not producing enough energy to call people to market them to talk about their businesses right now. I do do have some podcasts with some impressive leaders that absolutely people should be calling and giving their money to in life if they've got the means to do so. You can look at my podcasts on my website. You can click and do a pull down. You can listen to them. They should be out there in audio file as well as video file. If you find they're not out there in audio file and podcast land, please let me know because I've had a lot of cyber hacking going on in my life and I've had people literally deleting videos that were my lawful right to produce as an opinionated journalist or columnist of sorts. You see, what I'm really producing here is truly a column of sorts. I'm literally talking about things in an interesting and unusual way. I'm trying to get you to go, oh my God, I can't believe he said that. I'm trying to produce in you a factual understanding of homelessness. If you've never been homelessness, then homeless, then you cannot possibly imagine how it feels. I can produce in you that emotion by telling you what has all completely happened to a person that I love, like, and trust to let you see how it feels. But that's what a marketing man does. To talk to you about someone's personal and private body parts is sort of illicit and immoral. But to make a shelter into some place that won't honor a man if he's had a problem, if he's gone through a surgical issue, if he's had a malpractice situation, if he's literally gotten shortchanged by God, is beyond illicit, immoral, impractical. You see, the Lord God's people think they know the Lord, and if that's the case, then God made it all. Now, I'm getting on to a pastoral stint, and I'm not going to do that because half the pastors in the country will violate my rights and call me a satanic worshiper or anything else they'd like to call to anybody with any type of spiritual understanding of the Lord that's different from their own. My own mother can't understand that God might have gifted her child, children in different areas of life is not true, that she doesn't always recognize all their gifts. That might be completely true. But openly, if I say something like that, someone's like, oh, you're saying yo mama to yourself. And I'm not, because I'm not of that community. I'm literally talking about the truths of the world, that there are mothers that violate the rights of their children at any age. They take their property, they interfere with their contacts, they literally defy the Lord in those ways. Why would that be? Because the Lord God made us all. The Lord God is usually supposed to be the number one priority of a man's life, or a woman's life, or anybody who's sort of in the middle because God gave them those parts like that. We won't even talk about what they do to the people who come out with both. We make it like God didn't produce that. Really? How did that happen then? Science? Bastardization of the gene pool? Maybe. But openly, allowing that person at a certain point to make the decisions for themselves has to be made. Now, there's some wonderful stories about how the wrong decisions were made by physicians and how they marred a life, they destroyed an opportunity for a child, and they literally cut off some child's penis, and he really missed it later in life. Now, that's an amazing story that's been told multiple times over, where physicians play gods in the bodies of others. That is literally not their right. It destroyed a child's whole opportunity to make a child of his own, to produce an offspring. That's a story we can talk on another day. I'm trying to stretch you in your understanding of concepts. That homelessness, though, begins with the loss of employment, usually. It often continues because family members say, we're going to tough love this person and show them not to piss around in life. That's actually not what happens to people. When we lose income, we don't have the opportunity to produce for self technology. Technology is an absolute requirement in order to get a job, literally, today. If we can't afford a cell phone, we shut it off. Then we have to go to using computers through internet that's free. Why? Because we can't afford the internet bill. Then what we literally cut out next is the utilities. We don't have to have electricity all the time. I'm more than proved. I literally did a test in my apartment complex. I totally shut the electricity off for almost an entire month except for a few hours a day like running the radio or turning on the TV, or more importantly, using my computer, making little audio files, doing interviews with famous authors, which I have done. Showing my skills and my abilities is not exactly what happened. Highlighting those people's work was the celebration of their lives, not mine. I was honored to talk to those people. I never want anything I say now to push on people's minds to interfere with those wonderful people who honored me with their time, who gave me information on their life, who supported me by allowing me to honor, to 
honor their businesses and talk about them. Now, practically, when we talk about homelessness, we're really talking about the loss of life. We're talking about the loss, really, of relationships. Because why do people remain homeless? Because they don't have professional relationships. Now, one center just told me that they look at the person's skill sets, they try to find them a job in those skills. And I think, wonderful, is it a professional job or is it just what we call a bridge job? You see, a little bridge job does help to pay the bills, but it never gets that person out of poverty. Almost never. They continue to struggle for months, for years, literally. They might be able to start producing themselves some sales if they go into a consulting role, but they're always putting their emotions on the line in those moments because they literally die or live based on a sale. It's like commission sales. If you're hungry for lots of money and you're a great salesperson, it's a good way to go. If you're literally just trying to find work and you go into it, you literally starve to death a long time before you figure out the formula. Now, when I'm talking about real things, does this make sense to you? Because let's face it, everyone in the world has a home, usually. Everyone in the world has to produce an income, normally, in order to produce for them shelter over their heads when it rains and it snows and it sleets and the winds are blowing foul. They also need a vehicle. Why? Because almost every immature recruiter says, do you have an operating vehicle? And up to this point, I've really laughed on that. But in absolute truth, when a person's vehicle gets killed by someone or it's destroyed by total strangers in a parking lot or something just happens to it because it's old, it creates an incredible impact on their ability to provide for themselves and to get to work on time. It creates incredible stressors in that person's life completely. Now, we literally have car lots with hundreds of thousands of dollars of product on their lots not being sold because it's not the season or because there's not enough people to buy them, but somehow they have all that inventory on the lot and they never really think about creating a homeless initiative program where a homeless person could work towards purchasing that vehicle by doing something with their skill set to allow them to borrow that vehicle much like a lease program. There has to be someone who's got millions of dollars in those organizations who provides them with all those cars, literally the manufacturers do, based on some sort of dealings that would literally allow them to set five, ten cars of the hundreds they have on their lot aside for a homeless initiative car. It's sort of like those Indiegogo cars, but in those Indiegogo cars, you probably have to have some money and some serious cash in order to borrow them if you don't have a real car in life. It's a great idea for city dwellers, just like the bikes, just like the mopeds, just like even these stand-up driving things that I've seen running around. They look like a lot of fun. I'm not sure I've got enough practical balance at my age to do them, but they look like a hell of a lot of fun to get around town on. A little difficult to maneuver around people in a busy street, but openly, it's okay. People have an opportunity to get mobile with those tools. Even a scooter like the kids have would be great for an adult to have. I love scooters, absolutely adore them, especially the ones with handles. I can handle those. I can't handle a skateboard. I've tried, I've literally twisted my ankle as a youth and I won't do it again. But scooters are an incredible invention. That skateboard with a handle, what a deal. My nephews and nieces had one and literally it was strong enough to hold me and I got to utilize it a little bit in a zoo until they told me not to, but it was a great way to get around when my leg was not feeling well. Now, practically we're still talking about homelessness. You see, homelessness can be solved in one simple way, that people of the world realize they know lots of people, that they literally say, you know, I don't know what's really going on in this person's life. I don't really know the whole story of why they're homeless. But if there's somebody out there that literally has an opportunity to make a living that allows them to pay for their own apartment and live outside of a shelter, we're really looking for a network of professionals to provide us that HR information, to give opportunities in life to people who are trying to really get back on their feet, especially those who fall out at the highest of levels. If you go to any networking career group, you will find men and women in their 40s to 60s literally hungry for a position, but a lot of them too arrogant to take the ones that they're offered because someone saw other skill sets they had. There are men and women I'm going to call about them on name, I could literally, that I tried to offer a position to when I still had money. They literally said, no, they couldn't do that. It was too far for them to drive. The gas money wasn't good enough. I would have paid for all that when I had the money. Even if I didn't have a lot of money, I was willing to help someone else. In my homelessness, I know I've given away money in situations that I really thought, what am I paying for this for? But God included it in my path. And when I checked multiple times, am I supposed to do something here? He said, yes. 
Maybe really because the person needed it. Maybe because in life they couldn't get very far. But openly, that's what we're talking about today. Homelessness is solved by people taking action to help others because they could literally be there next. Most people are one or two paychecks away from homelessness is somewhat talked about by financial planners. We have to find out if that's really true. We only find out if that's really true if we're really talking to people about their homelessness. Today, I was in a marketing moment and the man said, well, you can just take a photo on your cell phone. And I didn't have the heart to tell him, I'm sorry, I don't have a cell phone anymore. You see, it's hard to talk about homelessness when you're trying to put the best face forward. When you're literally trying to keep clean by living out of a vehicle that someone is harming in the night. When you're literally trying to keep your clothes clean so that you can present yourself well at a job interview. When you're literally trying to keep the sweat from your body on sweltering hot days because why? Our parking lots have no shelter areas at all. And when we do sit in a parking lot, employees of those national companies that receive our money for sales and other things they sell to us literally crap all over us. There needs to be a homeless initiative that says our parking lot is okay for you to sit in. It's okay for you to sit in a chair. It's okay for you to sit in your vehicle as long as you're not bothering people and pestering them and begging for money. Now let's talk about that in another audio cast. I'm going to stop now and say this has been Blake Henson of Blaze Communications talking literally about why homelessness still goes on. Because people in the political realm, in the leadership realm, won't allow us to shelter people. People lose faith in those moments. They lose hope in those moments. They sometimes lose lives in their moments, literally because of the harm they receive from people who just attack their homelessness, who attack their lives, who attack their mental states, who attack them spiritually, who attack them physically, who destroy their beliefs in a loving God. You see, love is produced in the world through people. And making love in this world is about helping people who are homeless to go on in life. Again, Blake Jensen, Blaze Communications LLC, talking in magic and mayhem moments in life, taking back the talk of the world about real topics, authentic conversations, transparent life. Make moments matter, people. Reach out, help someone. It used to be a commercial on TV. I'm surprised it's not really running again. We all jump into the bandwagon for big issues, but talking to someone who's homeless in our life, who says, I really need a loan, I really need help in this situation, makes all the difference in the world to people. Make it a good day today, folks. Thanks for listening.